Hi everybody, welcome back. Okay, no introduction today. This is part two of the Harkle Children, a complete overview. And as we carry on and delve deeper, it gets worse and worse. And for those few of you who said I shouldn't even bother because you already know that either they don't exist or that Megan never birthed them, I'm doing this for myself as much as for you. What I will be doing is at the end of the day, I will cut the beginning and end of each video and I will knit them all together into one video and post it on my website. And that, my dear friends, will be for record keeping. Anyway, just a quick reminder for those few cowards out there who think they can threaten their way out of a lie. Go right ahead. Try your best and do your worst. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I ended the previous video with my personal experience with someone who knows certain members of the royal family well, relatively well, and a little by sight, mostly, depending on who they are. More than that, I cannot say. Number seven. Then, on July the 6th, there was supposedly Archie's christening. And I'm sorry, but there was nothing right about Archie's christening. Everything feels awkward, but let's start at the beginning. We supposedly saw other royals arrive for the christening, including Catherine and William. But even that was off, because personally, I do not know of two people who actually physically saw them arrive on that specific day, although there was a fair crowd in the streets. And how do we know that? Because journalists were interviewing people from the crowd. Photographs posted after the christening show Catherine arriving in one outfit, but photographed in a different outfit after the christening. The watch on William's arm shows a different time from the clock on the wall. Shadows are not consistent with the light source. So once again, photographs creating a mystery. And it is clear that christening photographs were again tweaked. How far they were tweaked, whether it was a complete copy and paste job or whether it was just tweaked, cleaned up or altered here and there, we cannot prove. Because we are not in possession of the original. Remember, in these videos, I'm not going to tell you or give you information just to be popular or just to go along with a popular opinion. I am giving you the truth. Anyway, a forensic scan does show cuts and alterations. And that is that. If anyone tells you anything else, they are lying. According to the brilliant solicitor I spoke about before, unless we have the original photograph in our possession, we can think what we want and use the scan which shows alterations, but it will not stand up in a court of law as proof that the christening was a lie. Not even the metadata on the christening photograph corresponds with the date of the christening. But that won't hold up in a court of law either, because every time you edit, crop, cut, or do anything to a photograph, the date will change. And it will, in most instances on most computers, show the date the image was last edited. If the time and date on the electronic device is wrong, then the date in the metadata will also be wrong. So again, although we see what we see, we cannot use the christening photographs to force the truth through a court of law or otherwise. But there is something else. On the 6th of July 2019, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, was at a synod meeting in York. Now, York to Windsor is, I think, about 215 miles as the crow flies. But to drive from York to Windsor is a little more and will take about 
three and a half hours. Now, according to a subscriber whose uncle is a bishop and who was at the synod meeting, he personally saw the Archbishop of Canterbury at nine o'clock or just after. If after, then merely a minute or two because the uncle was due in a discussion group which was due to start at nine o'clock but ended up starting at about 9.15. Then he saw the Archbishop sometime between 12 and 1 o'clock, 12 midday and 1 p.m. So let's say three and a half hours later. So how did the Archbishop get to Windsor, perform the christening and get back to York in, say, even four hours? Unless he flew privately. It is said Charles and Camilla arrived by helicopter from Scotland. So did they pick up the archbishop along the way? Even so, it takes a helicopter about 30 minutes to cover 100 miles. And obviously it is not hampered by traffic. So if the archbishop flew with Charles and Camilla, he would have made it there in time in just over an hour. So let's say the archbishop left York at 9.30, he would have been in Windsor by 10.30, 10.45, then conduct the christening. Now, how long would that take? 15 minutes to half an hour? Well, if they left via helicopter again by 11, they could have been back in York in time for the bishop uncle to see him just after 12. So, it is possible However, the clock on the wall states the time of the photograph at either 11.50 or if the watch hand just before the 11 is the short hand, not the long hand as I think it is, then it could be anything between a quarter to and five to 11. We were told Charles and Camilla went back to where they came from after the christening. We know thus that the helicopter would not have left without them. So neither time makes sense in getting Justin Welby back in York by 12 or just after. Imagine the rush. Land the chopper, run to the chapel, do the christening, run down the corridors of the castle, jump into place for the photograph, run back out to the helipad and fly back to York. It is absolutely possible, but not likely or probable. I can also tell you that in those days I was very, very diligent and tenacious and I wrote to the office of the Archbishop twice asking about this and both times I received acknowledgement, a standard reply with a christening requirement document attached. So number one, they received my email and number two, they must have read it to know it was about a christening and not a wedding, for instance. Yet, even though I suggested the helicopter flight in my second email, they did not grab at it as an explanation. Instead, they replied once again with their standard, thank you for your letter reply and an attachment detailing the requirement for christening in the Church of England totally ignoring the actual question. Now I'm asking once again, why? Because they don't want to lie for Meghan and Harry? I don't know. It was suggested to me that maybe the christening was not conducted by Archbishop Welby, but maybe by the Dean of Windsor at the time, Right Reverend Dr. Christopher Coxworth. But why then would Harry and Meghan lie to the media and tell them the ceremony was conducted by the Archbishop? Is it because they think they are so important or too important to have anyone else but the Archbishop conduct the christening? Once again, I don't know. But if something is off, it is the duty of the royal family or the monarch to make sure that it is cleaned up because a lie is a lie is a lie. It does not matter whether it is a big lie or a small lie. An important lie 
or a nonsensical lie. Letting these lies and inaccuracies hang in the air like a putrid smell is not making the monarchy a more trusted, more loved institution, nor does it make the current monarch more loved or popular. He has his own history, which does not always smell like roses. So to have this hang over him as well just adds that extra tang. As for Archbishop Welby, well, I'm guessing he's more concerned about all the accolades and honours the king bestows on him. In December 2023, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, received the Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order from the king for his role in the coronation. Well, I guess, okay, you know, everyone involved got something. But it is almost easy to understand why Welby prefers to stay silent. At least he told the truth about the wedding before the wedding, even though he had to go overseas to do so. So yes, Archie's christening is yet another mystery in the as yet short life of young Archie. Number eight. Okay, next, Archie's birth certificate. Now, I do not care to argue as to why or who instigated a change in Archie's birth certificate, whether it was the palace or Meghan. She says Buckingham Palace told her to change her title on the birth certificate. Buckingham Palace says they did no such thing. But, I mean, who cares? It really means very little at the end of the day. What concerns me is the fact that we have not yet seen the original of Archie's birth certificate. And with that, I mean a birth certificate with a parent's handwriting or signature on it. We have seen or are able to see a depiction of the original birth certificate of almost every royal child ever born, except of Harry's two children. No matter who asks or why, like I said in those early days, I was far more diligent and conscientious. So a solicitor friend or contact of mine asked a junior lawyer in her firm to request a copy of Archie's birth certificate. Now, oh gosh, I can't remember, but obviously somewhere between the time he was born in May 2019 and the time they stepped back in January 2020 is when we did that. And I think it was also after Archie's supposed christening in July 2019, because at more or less the same time, someone else was trying to lay eyes on his baptism entry. Anyway, neither request panned out. The lawyer was told Archie's details are under seal, and even at the time, A printed copy, like we have already seen, was denied. The same basically applied to the christening record, which was allegedly in safekeeping and not for public scrutiny. Now again, we have to ask, why? As there is nothing to hide concerning any of the other royal children, and these birth records have no bearing on their day-to-day safety, it is openly displayed and easily accessed on the internet. So why not Archie's? I'm not even talking about lilies at this point. That is a whole different kettle of fish. But Archie is six in line to the throne and born in Britain. So everything which applied to, say, William's children should apply to Harry's children. Yes, Archie is six in line. So according to British law, number one to number six are still obliged to ask the monarch's permission to, say, get married, for instance. We've spoken about Archie's unsigned 
birth announcement numerous times, all other royal children born to direct descendants of the monarch have their signed birth announcement posted at Buckingham Palace's gate. Archie's birth was indeed announced at Buckingham Palace's gate, but unsigned. Why? Why was it even allowed in the first place? Okay, guys, now I'm going to stop the video here. In the next one, we'll continue with lesser known or lesser talked about issues regarding the children. And we'll also move closer to the birth of Lily and the lies and strange illogical stories coming from that particular pregnancy and that particular birth. I'm going to do other videos on current matters in between this, but I'm going to go through these strange birth stories, talk through it until we have a full record of all the legitimate questions we have. Once done, I'm going to cut the introduction and the ending of the videos and attach them into one long video, and then everyone can use the compilation video to list your own questions and maybe direct them to Buckingham Palace. With those children being in the first 10 places in the line of succession, the citizens of England and the Commonwealth are 100% entitled to ask these questions. Okay guys, so until we meet again on the next one, please take good care of yourselves. Bye.